All right. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I will take the screen here in a second. And I'll touch base a little bit and reconnect to what happened yesterday. <clears throat> so yesterday, we, we started with Git. Uh, we created a repository. We created commits. We learned how to create branches. We also, at the end of the uh, lesson yesterday, we, we merged these branches back into the main development line, which, which was called either master or was called main. Today, together with Dania, we will uh, take this a step further. We will start out. So here on top, I have the, this is our collaborative document. And you can on top find our plan. So we plan for the exercise leads, we plan two exercises. There will be a lot of type along, but we will try to be more clear about when to type and when not to type. So thank you for the feedback. And we want to start with talking about conflicts. Oh, the first 20 minutes. I am watching the collaborative document. Please keep the questions coming. And uh, here I will maybe first navigate into the conflict resolution episode. Oop, a little bit hard to see. Okay, conflict resolution. So this is in, if you navigate it into this page with, mm -hmm. why don't I see the top of it? Okay, here we go. Um, here we are, conflict resolution. What is it? Um, this is, a, this is a term that we have been a little bit avoiding yesterday. Maybe some of you have seen it. We have, uh, with Dania, we have emphasized that Git is really good at combining different development lines. Uh, if you remember, we did, we experimented with uh, Cilantro on the experiment branch. And then we also modified the amount of salt on the less salt branch. But we modified the same file, but we modified it in two different places. And Git was really good at combining those. But what happens if, if we modify the same portion of the file in two different ways? What, how can Git, Git resolve that? And here, here we have an example. So let's imagine that we start with the following recipe. And so far, you don't need to type. You can, you can watch and think. Uh, we start with the following recipe. We have two avocados. We have one tablespoon of cilantro. We have two teaspoons of salt. Now imagine that there are two branches, branch A and branch B. This can be either two people. It could also be the same person that works on two different branches. And on one, on branch A, <clears throat> we, we add a line on top of the file, but we also modify, we reduce the, the amount of cilantro. In the meantime, on branch B, somebody adds half an onion. It's a good idea, but the person also thinks that, well, at the same time, let me increase the cilantro from one tablespoon to two. And now when we try to merge this, uh, Git will have no problems. <clears throat> Git will know that we want to keep this and we want to keep this, but it will not know, do we want half or do we want two? So it will, this is a conflict. This is a conflict in Git. It will happen and now we will learn how to deal with it. We will also see that, Git, that the conflicts are good. They are a good thing because they will prevent me from undoing accidentally somebody else's or my own changes. So whenever this happens, Git stops, says this is a conflict, please resolve, please tell me which of the two versions you like better, which of the two should I keep?
So again, a recap, this happens when uh, the same portion of the code, it doesn't have to be the same line, but the same portion of the code is modified on two different branches in two different ways. All right. There is a human side to it, and there is a technical side to it. Before going into the technical side, let's talk a little bit about the human side. Uh, what, how can we, how can we avoid conflicts? How can we minimize conflicts? Very often, we can avoid conflicts by talking to our colleagues, by planning. If I want to do a major change in the code that might affect others, uh, it's good if I inform them. It's good if I keep the branch short-lived. It's no surprise that if, if I branch off and I work secretly on my branch for six months and I never tell anybody about it and I never update any of these branches and I come back six months later, it's no surprise that I can expect a conflict or two. But when they happen, uh, it's often not too difficult to solve them. Let's learn how, how to solve them together. We will do that now with a type along. But let's prepare the situation. I know that some of you haven't been, haven't maybe have not been here yesterday. Maybe some of you got stuck with creating branches and merging. So what we have done is if you got stuck or if you joined later, then you can get started. You can run these commands in your terminal and they will bring your, you will get a new folder here called recipe after merge. And you will get the same situation that I have here still from yesterday. So you will get this guacamole recipe. There will be a couple of commits and there will be these three branches which we have all merged into master. And maybe I can give those of you who want to reset and start from this rather from what you have yesterday, maybe I can give you a minute to do that before we move on. Um, anything I forgot to say now also looking at HackMD. It's also completely fine to ask questions about yesterday and I appreciate that you do. There's a question if you'd like mm -hmm. to take it, rather than, uh, how does Git recognize the same part of the code? Yeah, it's, so it doesn't look like line numbers because it, that would be the, the simple thing, but it, it, it does more, more clever algorithms to, it compares changes and uses some clever algorithms to, to find the, the minimal, difference between the two changes. And I forgot how these algorithms are called. And I don't I don't even know which one of these Git is using. But it, it is using something more clever than just line number. There is another question about uh, your Git graph, uh, which, is, which is not showing uh, branches. So yeah. if, it, uh, if you remember, we deleted the branches yesterday. Yes, this is what I did here. Git branch minus D, experimental assault. And what that did is that it removed these labels, but the commits are all still there. If your branches are still there, it's not a problem. They can stay there. They will not, this will not upset any of the rest that we show. I, I just wanted to have it a little, little bit more organized. Okay, let's move on. So now it's a it's a good moment to type along. So you can restart either from the from the repository from yesterday or you restart from this one that we created here. If you run git graph, you should see something similar to this. If git graph complains that I don't know what graph means, this is not a command, this is not a recognized command. It means that yesterday we have defined in the branches episode this, this shortcut, this alias. So it is a shortcut for git log, one line decorate, something else, something else I forgot already. So it is, a, it is a shortcut. And one more thing to add, if you are cloning that uh, repository after merge, you will find the head point to master, origin master and origin head. 
Oh yeah. So, so there will be a little bit more here. And what this origin means, we will really clarify tomorrow. We will get a glimpse of it a little bit later this morning, but we will clarify tomorrow. So if you see the origin master for the moment, we can accept that this refers to GitHub. It will all become clear tomorrow. Now what we can all do is that we first make sure that we are all on the master branch. If you are on the main branch, this is also OK. Then in your head, please translate. Every time I mention master, please translate it to main. And I will now create two branches. One I will call like cilantro, one I will call dislike cilantro. Both of them I create from master. So let's do this. One is called like, one is called dislike, and you can already anticipate what will happen on these branches because we have a very descriptive branch name. Since I since I created the, these two branches, I didn't switch to them. I'm still on master. I can verify that Git graph. I am still sitting on master branch. There are now two new branches. They are all on the same commit. And now what we will do is we will do uh, two different modifications on the same file in the same portion on these two branches. On the like one, I will have I want more cilantro on the dislike one, I will reduce it. How did we switch to a different branch? It was git checkout. Git checkout like cilantro. And in here with, with, with your favorite editor, you increase the cilantro amount. And here I want to have two. Save and Git add ingredients, git commit. Um, and what, what is a good message? Uh, increasing amount of cilantro. This is, I'm on the like cilantro branch. Very good. Now I will switch to the dislike cilantro. And I will do the exact opposite. I will reduce it. From one to one half. Get add. Let's verify what we got. No. These two branches have moved on in two different ways. Um, I can compare them. For instance, now I can compare what is the difference between master and like cilantro. The difference is this. They differ in this one line. What is the difference between master and dislike? It's this difference. And if you want, you can also compare the, the two branches, like and dislike. And they differ in this one line. And now what do you expect will happen when we try to merge it? Uh, I will I want to merge both of these branches back into master. What is our expectation when we merge the first branch? What is our expectation when we merge the second branch? The first one will merge because yes. So it, the first one of them, and it doesn't matter which one I take, it will merge. And why will it merge? Because the, 
the change, let's say that I will first, I will first merge the like one. It will merge because this change happened topologically after the change in master. The master commit is an parent commit of this commit. It's a, he's, the master commit is an ancestor of this commit. And in this case, there cannot be any conflict because Git assumes that, well, we did this first and then we made another change and this is what we wanted. But it will conflict when I try to merge the second branch because, because they happened, the one is not the ancestor of the other. If I look at the graph, they didn't happen one after the other. They happened sort of in parallel. And it doesn't even matter to get which happened first or later in time. So that, that actually doesn't matter. So let's demonstrate it. First, before merging, let's make sure that I'm back on the master branch. Check out master or main. And you can verify that with git graph or with git status. I am back on master. And now I will first try to merge the like one. Merge like cilantro. This will work. It, it will probably open up the editor and let you edit the commit message. No, it didn't. It didn't because it, it is a so-called fast forward merge, something we didn't uh, mention yesterday. Uh, but there is, there is an optional exercise in the branch episode, which explains what a fast forward merge is. In short, for us, it, it, is, a, it is a merge that doesn't create a new merge commit. And I can verify that. Because now um, I merged the like cylinder changes into master, but Git could do that by moving the sticky note from here to here. It didn't have to create a new merge commit. And this is a fast forward merge. My, in, now in the second step, I will try to do Git merge this like cylinder. And now we expect trouble. And here it is. It, it tries to automatically combine these changes. It raises a conflict. Automatic merge failed. When, whenever this happens, the first thing I do, and let's see whether this matches also the material, is it does. The first thing I do is git status. OK, we have unmerged paths. And then I look at the red information here. There is one file which has been modified by both, in this case, both branches. Both branches modified the ingredients. And it gives me hints on what to do now. And so I first look at git status to find out which, which is the problematic file. Then what I do next is I open this file in a text editor. So this is one way to solve a conflict. We will show you also different ways. And I open it up in my text editor, and you will see and please do the same, that now Git added something into the file. This stuff wasn't there before. This and this and this. So it adds markers on where it is not sure what to do. And if the file is longer, I search for these, I search for these markers. So on one branch, we increase the two. On the other one, we reduced which one should we keep. And here, the human needs to decide. It's not up to the computer anymore. And the way to resolve it is then we decide what we want. And I will, I will now decide that I'm personally actually not such a big fan of cilantro. I will reduce it to half. And then deciding means taking one of the two. You could also modify it to something else. And then removing these markers. So don't leave these markers in your code because they might break, they might break your code. So you need to really actively remove these. I keep half. Remove all these markers. Once you are happy, again, save. Save the file. And then back to git status. Git, I have removed these markers, but git doesn't know that 
I'm happy with the resolution. I need to I need to mark resolution. I, I do that with Git add. So again, we stage this change. We we prepare it for the next commit. Git add ingredients. By Git add, I tell Git I have resolved all the conflicts in this file. Back to Git status. Now it will turn green. And now I can commit the change. And this will create a merge commit. Git commit. Let's leave out the minus n. And oh, OK, so maybe I should change the color so that it shouldn't be black. Git prepared again a commit message for me. All these, all the lines that start with a hash. Just a sec, I'll make it a little bit more visible. All the lines that start with a hash will be ignored. It suggests a commit message for me. Sometimes, sometimes I like to even uncomment this so that it, it ends up in the commit message that I know that there has been a conflict and what was the conflict, but this is really up to you. You can leave it like this and save and exit. And now we got a new commit, git graph, finally. And we have resolved the conflict. So this, this is the merge commit, which resolves the conflicting merge between this and this one. OK, let's see what the questions are. Mm -hmm. I was typing too fast. But let's summarize the essence. The essence was whenever we get a conflict, Git adds resolution markers. First step I always do is Git status to find out which files are affected. I open these files in my editor. I look for these resolution markers. I look for these resolution markers, these ones. And then I decide. And with git add, I inform git that I have resolved the conflict. One thing I forgot to do is to do git diff, which can be also interesting. Now it's too late, <clears throat> which shows you then only the conflicting portion of the code. This was the manual resolution. This is not the only way, but I think it's good to, to understand what is happening. Oh, there are other ways to resolve a conflict. I will now scroll down and show you. This is an exercise we will not do today, but you can try it later. There are graphical tools like oh, oh, in our install instructions, we have optionally, we suggest to install visual comparison tools which can make it easier for you to do git diff and git merge and conflict resolution. And then you can see one branch on one side of your screen, the other one on the other side of the screen. In the middle, you see the conflict. And then you can decide which one you like by clicking these tiny arrows. That's one way. We will also see tomorrow a conflict, how it looks on GitHub. So one can, one can resolve conflicts also through the web interface directly on GitHub or on GitLab. Maybe just mentioning that this exists, we will not show how that works. But if you have many files, 10, 20 conflicting files, and sometimes you know which branch you want to keep, and you don't want to open each one of these 20 files and go through all these resolution markers and manually edit this all out, sometimes you know which one to keep, and then you can Tell it to Git, and it will then, in doubt, take everything from branch A or everything from branch B. So these are these hours or there's strategies. I appreciate comments 11 and 14. It was too fast and too confusing and difficult to follow along, and I apologize. What can we? What did I? How can I? How can we summarize this better? Um, on the positive side, what I can say is that the things that I did too quickly here, I followed precisely the material, and I encourage you. I know this is not, 
right now is maybe not the time, but maybe maybe this afternoon, later this week, uh, test it out. And you can always ask us later. It is a bit of a spillover from yesterday. That's why we didn't go into a group exercise for this episode here. Yeah, probably it was nice to mention that uh, the takeaway from this course is you know the functionalities of Git and uh, not remember every command that you will do after you have some more experience and you get more, become an expert in Git. Mm -hmm. So uh, these days we will show the commands so you know the functionality, that's the takeaway. And if it's overwhelming, that's not, it's not a big deal. You know the functionality, you, the materials are here, you can come back anytime and you can search also on the web. Yes, that's a very good point because so no expectation that you remember the commands or the sequence of commands. I'm happy if we all now know what a conflict is, how it can happen, that it makes sense, that it doesn't just override anything. It will always stop and ask us and that there are ways to, to avoid it by discussing um, when, when we collaborate with others, if I want to do anything that is maybe more significant, open an issue on GitHub GitLab and inform, discuss with others what I plan to do, at least then they know. And then this has been also emphasized yesterday, if, if I share my changes early and often, there is a larger change than, than other people on other branches are informed and we can, we can avoid conflicts or deal with them as early as possible. It's also fun to think about how, how does Git compare to other collaborative platforms like Google Drive? Can you have any conflicts there? Why not? Is that, is that better? Is that worse? So you can think about these things. Today we will have uh, continue with the sharing repositories online. Uh, so we are we were uh, we asked you to have a Git, uh, create a GitHub account, and I see most of them have already an account. So we will not spend uh, time on logging to GitHub uh, during this uh, session. Uh, I assume that you are already logged into GitHub. So this is uh, a follow along, a follow along, or try. At the end of the little bit type along to uh, also, but uh, there will not be any exercise during this. But uh, for the objectives of this session, that we get a feeling of uh, remote repositories. More, more of this you will learn tomorrow with the collaborative Git. Um, we are going to publish our uh, current recipe repository to the web and uh, fetch and track the repository from the web. That's the uh, uh, main objectives of this uh, session. So now we have our repository in our local laptop or your computer. Um, when, when should one uh, need to uh, move from laptop to uh, web? Uh, rather than what's the benefit of having it on web as well? It's backup. Yeah. So if I hard drive fails, or if I forgot my laptop in the bus. Uh, it's also sharing with others. So making it visible, making it possible for, for others to collaborate, to build on top of it. Mm -hmm. That's, we will uh, look into it uh, tomorrow more. Uh, but also if, um, by mistake, we delete the history, which we stored in uh, .git file uh, folder. So then we used all the version control. We missed all the version control. So it's always nice to have one backup on the web and uh, get the visibility that even though you are not collaborating, you could get the visibility that, uh, that you are doing something. Um, so now we will learn how to work with the remote repositories. Uh, how, how do we define remote? What uh, what actually this means? So I think of it as this uh, dot git part, but on a different computer. Oh, so in the in the cloud. In uh, but it could be on a. I think traditionally it has been on the .git part on another university server. 
these days, most of the time, it's somewhere in the cloud, on, on the web, in, on GitHub, on GitLab, on Bitbucket. So that's how, that's how I think of remote repositories. Yeah. So today we are going to use the GitHub uh, cloud service. And do you have any other, uh, are you using other, other services as well, Radovan? Right other than GitHub? Yeah, I use GitHub and GitLab, and I use also the Code Refinery GitLab. And I think that's it. OK, yeah. So today, we will uh, this is the type along and click along, I would say. That's the first time we create, uh, we move to GitHub. And uh, I request you to log into your uh, GitHub account with your credentials. So I have already logged in. So it's probably. Okay, uh, I could uh, move a little bit. So I, uh, am I sharing the screen? Yes. Okay, if you, uh, if you moved into, uh, if you logged into your GitHub account, you could see that uh, you, you will come up to your uh, home. I would say on GitHub. So in, in GitHub, we, now we are going to create a repository for our, uh, and move our, I would say, copy our recipe repository to, uh, to the GitHub cloud service. So uh, you could uh, click here on the new uh, tab, uh, or there is other option, another option also I should mention that uh, this uh, less sign, you could create a new repository here as well. So I will go for this uh, for the time being. And then Git will show you a template to create uh, um, a new web repository uh, here. And you could see that uh, the owner is, uh, my, uh, my new username is the owner. And for you, it will be yours, your username. And this is my local. Uh, and I am also part of the core of our organization, so I could, uh, no, I have another owner session as well, but I for this session, some, please. Okay. Is it all fine? Looks good. Okay. Yeah. So here we can create a um, repository name. You, we could uh, go with the same uh, or um, another uh, name. Would you suggest some other names uh, for this uh, repository, Darwin, or you would like to have the same name for the cloud uh, repo or? I would take the same, but it doesn't have to be the same as the folder. So these things don't have to be any way connected, but make, let's make it recognizable. Let's call it recipe. Mm -hmm. Unless um, you already have a repository called recipe, then you need to call it something else. I hope I don't have anything. Um, so there is an optional description. It's always uh, uh, nice to have a uh, description about uh, about the pro uh, project or you are for your repository so that it's uh, when you collaborate uh, with some uh, when, or people who are going to copy your report get a overview of what is uh, what is this uh, repository so i would say a okay I had one recipe, and this is there is uh, two options uh, for when you create a repository on cloud. Uh, you could make it public and private. When when it is public, you are sharing with uh, this repository with everyone else. Uh, so, what should we use here, public or private? I would use your public, mm -hmm. and uh, is if this... I'm developing something, okay, yeah. Is this a type along or do we just watch now? It's a type along. Uh, 
Yeah, there are some suggestions to initialize this repository from GitHub. So we are not going to uh, click on this because if uh, we do, we it's all, it will create a uh, readme file. Uh, we don't want to change our history from our local repository, which we created yesterday. Did I miss something? No, it's good, but we can, so just to reemphasize, this creating readme file and the git ignore and license, these are normally good things, but in this case, we don't want to do that because we, we don't want a different commit because this would otherwise create a repository with a commit with these files inside, but we already have our own files. We have our own readme and we have our own, no, we don't have our own git ignore yet, but so here we will not click anything. And just because maybe we were not super clear that everybody should try this out. Um, how did we find this page? How did I get into here? Yeah, you log into GitHub account with your credentials. And then, and then on top right, there is top right, there is a plus. Uh, okay, mm. you created your repository. And name the repository. And uh, if optional, even though optional, we recommend to have a description uh, for your repository. And if you would like to keep it private, you can do it. And uh, for the sake of this course, I do when I'm developing something until I am find that uh, my code can be shared with everyone. So that's yeah. also an option, but uh, how do you prefer that one? Do you prefer public? For this exercise, uh, I recommend public because we will see a bit more functionality. Mm -hmm. And if you are worried that, well, I don't want to create any stuff that will stay there forever, we can also show you how, how you can remove this again. Yeah. So I'm clicking creating repository. Then here, uh, GitHub is uh, showing, suggesting something for us to uh, create a new repository if you, uh, from the command line, uh, like uh, initializing and committing and adding that uh, to the uh, GitHub uh, repository. But uh, for uh, now, we are going to um, push our existing uh, repository, which we created yesterday and uh, we worked on today as well. So there are some commands here and GitHub also suggested to, suggest to import a code from another repository. That's also possible. And I would like to mention something here on the upper part of there are two staffs uh, which mention uh, the network for protocol, uh, HTTPS and SSH. So if you pre, uh, click on HTTPS, you, you could see that it changes uh, here. And we we are supposed, we are recommended to um, use SSH. It's because more safe, uh, secure, or is there any other re reason as well, right away? Uh, to use the SSH uh, protocol? Uh, we recommend SSH because we were a little bit unsure this HTTPS protocol was about to disappear from GitHub. So that's why we modified our, so that's why we recommend SSH. It's also then, yeah, that's why. Okay. We thought it, it's more stable, but it's also uh, yet another thing to learn. And for this to work, uh, the learners, are, uh, we assume that they added the SSH key Yes. Yeah, so uh, here we can try these uh, three commands. So what does it mean actually? Uh, git remote add origin and there is a URL of the current uh, repository we have created on GitHub. Um, so I remember we have a, we got a question about remote. How do we define remote? Remote is a reference to the repository on the web or on the server or on remote. Am I right? Or is there more into that simply no, defining remote? I think that's it. So a remote is an address. It's an address where to find where to find this repository in a different place. And these terms like git remote and git push, and we also have a question, what does that even mean, git push? They are now a little bit falling from the sky. And 
we will really clarify them tomorrow. So tomorrow we go in depth and really explain what is really a remote, what is really happening when we get push, what is really happening when we get pull, which is not even mentioned here. Um, for the moment, it's the remote will be. Uh, so these three commands, which are listed here, we will run them in our terminal. And here we will define that we will connect our local repository with a remote repository. And the address of the remote repository is git at github.com, et cetera, et cetera. And we also give this remote, uh, we give it a shortcut and we call it origin. And also uh, to mention that uh, this uh, would be different for you. It should uh, be your username uh, in the URL. So let's go back to our terminal and uh, uh, let us push our local repository, which we created from yesterday to the to GitHub. So um, I see GitGraph and uh, I am on my main branch. So there are three commands, git remote, add, and git branch minus m main. This is actually renaming the master branch to main. Yeah, I have the, my master branch as main already, but it's okay if, uh, if you have uh, your master branch as main, it doesn't uh, change anything if you type um, copy paste to these commands. And then, git push minus u origin main, uh, this will, this command will push your local repository to the GitHub origin uh, is, or it, your local main is mapped in uh, in the GitHub repository. Uh, yeah. In the so repository. Maybe, or maybe it, uh, adding, adding here that, so this push command will upload all commits that are in main in, onto origin. It will publish, so push, upload. I think of it as uploading. It uploads all everything that belongs to main over to origin. And what is origin? In this case, it's something that sits on GitHub. It's our remote repository. And again, more meaning to it tomorrow. Yeah. So maybe I would like to see my. Um... Um, a history of uh, commits and uh, just to check when I uh, move to uh, the web, it will, it's showing. So um, I, I requested to copy these commands uh, from your GitHub uh, repository you created just now. So I'm doing it from mine. And copy paste it and it will ask my SSH uh, key pass place. I have uploaded uh, my keys on GitHub. So let me see whether I managed to type my pass place right. Yes. So you should see something similar like this after you push uh, your repository to the remote uh, GitHub. So what just happened now, we could go back to our GitHub and just uh, refresh. Yeah. You see your local repository is in on web now. So now there are a few interesting things. So we see that the README that we created gets displayed here. And that's yeah. nice because that can that is very often the first contact point. So that's a place where we can write something about the project. How this works, mm -hmm. how to install it, um, how to cite the authors and where to find more documentation. We see all our files. Then then interesting thing, there is this clock 12 just above, just below the green button. They are a little bit below. There is this below the green button. I mean, under it. Yeah. Oh uh, well. Okay. So oh yeah, this, this one. That thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So now we see all our commits. They are there with yeah, their I'm... with their identifiers, and you can look at those and you can compare them. Um, yeah. We see only the 
maybe I want to show one more thing, and that is if you scroll up, and maybe you need to zoom out just a tick because it's under settings. No, it's not under settings, under insights. So insights, top right. Uh, uh, I put uh, uh, here. Oh, or there, you know, yeah. This one. No, the insights one. Okay. And then network left. On the left bottom side, there's network. And we see also the commits in there. So here they are. We see how they branched out and how they recom how they merged. And you can even move the mouse over the commits and it will tell you what has happened there. Uh -huh. And uh, if you go back to the code and you will uh, see that anyone can um, clone this repository which since I made it public. And what does cloning mean? Cloning means uh, copying everything yeah. down to the if, computer. If you have done this uh, uh, recipe merge uh, after merge today, that you have already done that cloning part. But maybe Labrador, when you can show how to clone and see that uh, the, you have all the commits there. Maybe before you take over the screen, I would like to mention something also about the uh, settings. See if you can do something there if you want to delete uh, or you want to make it private after uh, after so you go down and um, there are many options here where else it? it should be somewhere Am I separating this? I am I sharing now? Yes, I think so. At least in what I see, yes. Okay. So there's many questions in HackMD okay. that say something like, "Yeah, I will come back to that." Get at GitHub permission denied. Public key. Okay, you'll come to that. Oh, okay. oh to the public key now. Okay, yeah. so the, yeah. if you. So, mm -hmm. So if you're getting permission denied public key, then probably your SSH key is not set up. This was part of our initial setup. This is actually good. So for now, watch. Uh, you won't need it for the rest of the lesson. And then you can work on it later today, and then it is needed tomorrow. Okay, there yeah, are some... So tomorrow we will absolutely need it. Um, there was a question on um, what did you do after typing these commands? Because you copy pasted the commands and then it was there. And what, what Dania did is go back to GitHub and reload the page. So if you reload the same page, then these instructions are gone. And instead, then all the files and commits were there. Okay, yeah. And by web interface, we mean github.com slash your username in your browser. So a browser. There was also a question on how do we get rid of this again? I will show that. Yeah. Uh, Should I try to those... clone your repository? Is there yes. anything else? Yeah. She, uh, can you take over my screen and uh, see what you can? Yep. Let's do. Here we go. And I found your, I found your repository. How so did you is, find it? Oh, because I remembered your username. <laughs> and oh, then I looked. But, hmm? but you can always find this repository if you go do the Google search. I do sometimes. So, uh, with, yeah, you know that is something. Um, that's that's possible. If this is a um, reasonably known repository, but this was now created five minutes ago. And yeah. so, yeah, that's how I found it. But many of the prominent projects are there and you can you can search them and find them. So this is your repository. I cannot write to it, but I can, since it's public and it says up here it's public, I can I can clone it. And by cloning means I can take a copy of everything onto my computer. Before doing that, oh, sorry. 
before doing this, I want to make sure that I'm not inside my own recipe here. So I will I will go outside of this because I don't want to create a Git repository inside another Git repository. Not, not this time. And if mm -hmm. I want to have a copy of everything, sorry? Yeah, you will be fetching all the commits I made here. So you will have all the history and everything. Yes. Which one should I take here? Actually, it doesn't any either of the two will work because should I try with SSH? Hmm. And it's also nice to mention uh, you can download as a zip file as well, but then will you get this uh, history? I'm not sure. So the zip file, that's also interesting. So first of all, I forgot to do something with my keys. Give me a second to unlock them in a different window. Okay. Let me try this one here. Let me try with the stage first. So I copy this address and then I can say git clone uh, this address that I copied. And then if I don't do anything else, it will create a directory called recipe minus. But I can give it a different name. If I give it a different name, it will create a folder with this name here. And now it copied not only the files, it copied all the history also, all the branches. Well, in this case, there is only one branch. So if I go in here and I do git log one line or a git graph, I will see that there is a history to it. I copied really everything. If I would download the zip file, I would get only the files for this version. Then you can you can download the different zip file for different branches. It would not have the history in it. I think we can try and verify. Oh, uh, what else? And you can delete uh, the repository if you want. Yeah. One two or it you can change it later to public a private to public and public to private or something. Yeah. So how do I do this? Uh, I cannot delete your repository, obviously. Yeah. But should we should we show that on your screen or? Yeah, it could uh, or uh, you could mention some other repository. Or I create a new one on my side, just a yeah. test one and delete it. Okay, let's let's create a new one because it's anyway good to show how this worked because we were a little bit too fast. New repository. Where do I want it? I want it under my username and it will be just for testing. Oh, I know this is too small. To be removed, delete it any moment. I make it public. In this case, <clears throat> let's just see what happens if I do read readme. Readme, and I want to have a license. We will talk more about licenses next week. And I also want to have a git ignore. We remember git ignore from yesterday. And I want to have a git ignore that is suitable for our code. Then it will already give you good suggestions on what files are good to ignore. Let's create it. And now there are already some files in it because I asked GitHub to create them. It also created a commit for me. There is one commit. Now, how do I get rid of a repository? If I zoom out, there is settings. Settings, top right. And then if you scroll down, lots of things you can configure and tweak. But all the way down, there is something called the danger zone where you can make different things. I can You can transfer repositories to somebody else. You can archive repositories, but you can also delete them. So of course, this be careful and don't do this on anything important. How do you do that change visibility? Then if you can make it public. Yeah, here I can, so you can switch to private yeah. or public. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
the, here I can delete, and this will be also really good. We will remember this one when we talk next week about making our code findable and citable. We will talk about Zenodo, and then we will remember this thing because that's exactly the reason. We want, sometimes it's good to preserve repositories forever and not to make them delete, not to delete them. But here, I understand the consequences. Goodbye. And you will get and, SMS. And I need to authenticate. So I need to type my password, which I will now maybe, well, I can do it. Oh, uh, just a sec. And here we go. And it's good. And it's all gone. So what, what else can we talk about before the break? Uh, uh, can we take some questions here? Oh, yeah, I should maybe just scroll down to the questions. So there were lots of trouble with the with authenticating. We will need to fix that for tomorrow. In our install instructions, we have nice instructions. We also have a video which we recorded with Richard where we showed how to do this. So please, please try that. It takes five to ten minutes. Okay, welcome back. And before we switch to a different episode, I think we need to hear or comment a bit on. The many questions about uh, SSH, passphrase, uh, not being able to push the changes. So uh, we see that it is it is confusing. It is not easy. If you are new to SSH keys, they, they are complex things. Um, we require them because we have to. We will, for, there is no other way for us to, um, to authenticate towards towards GitHub. The good news is for the rest of today, we will not need them. So if you if if you saw errors happening, you need to fix it until tomorrow. Tomorrow we will need them again. Um, where do you find install instructions? So here I'm sharing the workshop page and uh, we have a requirement section um, and we have this preparation part on software installation. We have a checklist. We we also have videos on short videos that we recorded with Richard on how to configure Git, how to set up SSH keys, both in text and in video. And please follow these, uh, because tomorrow we will need it. Um, I know it's not easy. Like the SSH passphrase is something else than the GitHub password, and it's yet another account, but we have no other choice. Um, on the positive side, once you have been through this and you have set it up, and once it's working, then this is something that you can use not only for GitHub, you can also use it for other services, like GitLab. You can use it for your computing cluster. There are many services that you can then authenticate with the same uh, SSH key pair. So this is not something coupled to GitHub. Uh, what we should have done, also the, uh, we appreciate the feedback about the too fast type along. I think what we should have clarified and we will try to make that better is that we should clearly say when it is okay to type along, but also okay not to, because I think I should have signaled that it's not a problem if you don't type along because you will not need it later. And also what Dania showed, the, the upload, we will not need it later today. And I will try to be clear on that so that you can relax a bit. And if something doesn't work, you know that it's not a problem. If you if if it doesn't work on your computer, you can still follow the rest of the workshop. We also have 250 to 300 registrations. And and we offer install instructions, install sessions, install lab sessions, videos. But of course, it's impossible for us to make sure that everybody has everything prepared. So please bear with us. Uh, it's, it's really hard. 
now we will switch gear a little bit and go into the next episode, which is about inspecting history. And I want to show you how to find it. So on in the schedule, now I'm navigating to, to this part here, inspecting history. And I will do a little bit of demonstration, 15 minutes. And then the plan is to send you into an exercise and to give you some, to, to really give you half an hour for this. Uh, you can also find it in the introduction to version control with Git on the left side, inspecting history. So this is where I will now go into. I will zoom in to make it a bit more readable. Uh, before we start, please make sure that we, we are not anymore <clears throat> in our cooking recipe from before, because now we will work with, with an existing Git repository created by somebody else. So when you type git status, you actually don't want to see that I'm already in our Git repository. I want to go outside of that one. And in the next 15 minutes, there are now two ways to participate. You can try to follow along what I do. I will try not to be too quick, but you will not need, you will not need this on your computer. All I want to do here is to demonstrate a couple of commands so that, they, that you know they exist. And then you can test out these tools in, in the exercise. There will be four different tools. And they are all listed here. And then you can, you can apply them then in the, in the exercise. So you can, one way to participate is to, to watch and uh, interact through HackMD. As a little warm up. Oh, this is this is a, a fun little tool. It's a Git history browser, which you can uh, you can actually use it with any repository in GitHub. In this case, I will so I will do some experiments on a repository which is on GitHub called Network X. Network X is some Python project written by lots of people, and it does network analysis in Python. For this demonstration, it doesn't matter that it's Python, and it doesn't even matter what it does. But I wanted to take an existing project written by somebody else, because very often we don't start building on a, on a nice green lawn when nothing is still there. But very often we enter a project as a student, master student, as a PhD postdoc, and there is already a building created by some, somebody else. And we need to find our way through it. And we, we need to navigate, and we need to add something to this, to this building. If you have a, so let's look at this uh, Git history browser, which is a fun little tool. And you can run it with any repository on GitHub. In this case, it's this Network X and on any file. And here I can, I can navigate with left and right arrows. And on top, you see different people who did different changes. And this is some readme file. And we see how it evolved over time. I mean, here I'm now traveling back in time. And I think it's, it is a really neat way to to visualize what Git is really doing and what Git is really tracking. So projects are evolving. Often we don't start from, from zero. Often we enter something written by somebody else. And here I want to show you a few tools that, that are incredibly helpful when navigating a project, which can also be your own. Okay, and what, what did I say here? So now if you want to if you want to try this out, you can you can do it as well. I will now follow these instructions. I will clone this repository onto my computer. So I make a full copy of everything. And now it copies all the commits, all the branches from this Python project onto my computer. And I will do some archaeology in it. And the first First incredibly useful command that I use all the time is git grep. 
And those of you who, who know the grep from the Linux shell, it's a tool that where I can search through files for a specific text or pattern or line. Okay, so now I cloned this repository and I can go in. And here are, I could do a git graph. And there, there are lots of commits that I didn't write. Let's go out with Q. With Git Grab, I can search for something. You can search for a, a text, or you can search for a text with spaces. If you know that somewhere in the code, I know that there is a function that contains this and this text, but I don't know where in the code, you can Git Grab for it. You can also Git Grab with minus i, that means ignoring case, case insensitive search. One thing that can be fun in some projects is to git grab for fix me or to do or uh, let's let's see what so there are some oops, not fix c fix me there are a couple of fix me's in this project and this git grab command will list me all the files that contain this text that I was looking for, and it will also highlight it. And now I know that if I know, want to know more about it, I can open up this file and browse it. Another very useful command, and we have seen that already, is git show. And this is if I want to have a look at a particular commit. I can give it a hash. A hash is a jargon for these identifiers. So if I want to have a look at a particular commit, I can do git show and the commit identifier. I can even, it's enough to give it only the start because if it is unique. So is there a commit with that identifier? And if yes, what does it contain? Yes, there is a commit with this identifier. And it has been written by somebody two years ago. This is the commit message. And I can also then inspect what was added, what was removed. And I can browse this with uh, up and down arrows. And I get out of it with Q. So git. Git grab, git show, git show, incredibly useful to have a look at a particular commit. Just catching up here with uh, HackMD, with the document. What is the difference between simple grab and git grab? In a grab, you typically grab for a text in one file. But with git grab, you search for, for in the entire repository. That's the difference. It's also a lot faster. And now the question changed. What is the difference between graph minus R? Yeah, somebody can reply that. Oh, then, it, then it becomes suddenly very similar. But the git graph is the faster one, probably. OK, let's look at git annotate. This is my favorite command in history inspection, and we have seen it yesterday briefly. And it is to annotate code with commit metadata. You can try it out on any of your files, which are tracked with Git. Git annotate some file. Let's take one file that exists in this, in this project. Git annotate this file. And I wonder how that will now show up. Um, it's, I can imagine it's not perfectly readable, but I will show you another way to look at this. On the right hand side is the actual file, line one, two, three, four, five, six. On the left hand side, for each line, there is the, which is the commit which modified it, this line last. And this is also super useful. 
if you want to know who can I ask, or if you find a problem and you want to know how long did the problem exist, when was it introduced, when was this line modified last. And if you don't like to look at it in the, in the terminal, you can also open it up in the browser. Let's try it out. So network X convert matrix. So in my GitHub project, there is a file. I need to find that file, just to have the same file network X convert matrix. You can click on the file. And now I only see the code. But if you click on blame, which is a very unfortunate naming, it should be called annotate. Then you get the same output. On right side is my project. On left side is the corresponding commit. And the bonus of doing it in, the, in my browser is that I can click on these commits and then look at them individually. If I want to do that in my terminal, I need to use git show. What else do we have? We have git checkout minus b. And we have very briefly mentioned it yesterday, that the git checkout minus b is a shortcut to create a branch, create a branch with branch name, and switch to it in one go. And if I only type this, it will create a branch at the position where I am right now. But sometimes you want to create a branch in the past, and then you can give it a commit identifier in the past. And this is the preferred way to inspect the code in the past. So if I want to have a look, how did the code look back a few years ago in this when the commit was with this identifier, I can create a new branch called all the code from that place and switch to it. And then I can navigate to archaeology, run some tests. How was it back then? And once I'm done, I go back to main or master. And I can delete this, this branch. And this is a very nice way of doing archaeology in an, in an old version of code. So did I miss anything? Quick look here at the document. Not too many questions yet. So now let me prepare you for the exercise session. We have a main exercise called history one. You will have half an hour for it. If, if you have time left and you want to do a bit more, if you scroll further down, there is, there is an optional exercise as well. What is the goal of the main exercise? The main exercise is you will, you will clone, uh, you will clone this project, this network X project, and it's a project that we don't know, and it's okay. That will be the first step. You will clone it, and then you will check out a branch called exercise, and you will check out that branch from a particular point in the past. And this is to make sure that, because this project is evolving, I want to make sure that this exercise is still working uh, because they, of course, they don't know about our workshop. <laughs> uh, so that's why I check up a particular version in the past because I know that that one will not change anymore. And then uh, on the top, we have seen git show, git annotate, git grab, git checkout minus b. Using these commands, you have a couple of tasks, and there is also there is a solution here, but I will not open it up, not to spoil the fun. First step will be in this project, find, find the file and find the line which contains this text. Somewhere in this project, there is this logic error in degree correlation. Why is this a useful thing to know how to do? Because sometimes you are in a project and you get an error message and you want to know 
where in this project does the error message come from? Now you know how to find it. Next step will be find out when was this line last modified or edit and find the actual commit which modified that line. Inspect that commit with git show and then um, once you have done that, try to create a branch pointing a branch in the past um, or to when that commit was created so that we are able to browse the code as it was back then. And then final question, how would you bring your code to the commit precisely before it was introduced? So just before that line was introduced or modified, how do you bring your Git repository to that state? And that, that may take, so we will give you half an hour time. And as I said, further down in the page, there is more. There is something about Git bisect. If you are interested in that, have a look. Uh, before the break, we sent you to this Git archaeology exercise. And now what we want to do in the next 10 minutes is to discuss this a bit. I think I want to show, maybe I will also try that on my terminal and then we can discuss some of these steps. And then I will hand over to Dania who will then show us a couple of more really cool things about Git. So let's try this together. And the solution is also here in, uh, it, it is here, but anyway, I will, I will test it out and also try to answer some of the questions that came up in, in the document. We started out by copying this project onto my laptop. Then going into the directory, and then I checked out a branch called exercise from a particular version. This could be a commit identifier. In this case, it is a. In this case, it's actually a tag. So this is a tag that refers to a commit. We we heard about tags yesterday. Git status. So I'm on this I'm on this branch called exercise. And now we have a couple of tasks. Where is this text? I, if I want to search where is something, I use git grab. Git grab for that text. Where is logic error in degree correlation? It is in this file here. Okay, now we know where it is. When this line was last modified or edit, for this I use git annotate. Git annotate on this file, git annotate. Oh, window. And now I need to search. Oh, so was it forward slash logic? Error. And don't remember the rest. That was it. And what I see here, this is wrapping around the line is too long for my screen here, but it's it's nine oh five four four. That's the commit. I go out of this annotation queue. And what did I want to know, do now? I want to have a look at that commit. And is it even the right one? Hopefully. Git show what happened in that commit. So this is something that happened in 2017. This was the commit message. And if I wanted to see what was added, what was removed, I can browse this change. Just for fun, maybe, uh, I can also show you that we can browse the same change on GitHub. I already lost the project. Network X. You can click here on any of these commits. For instance, this one. 
and you get an address github.com this is the github address commit and here's the commit hash now i can actually replace it by the one that i'm looking at right now which is 90544b4 and i can inspect the same thing in my browser as well if that makes it easier to browse and inspect so that was our task then we had to do a little bit more we had to create a branch pointing to the past when that commit was created. Uh -huh. How was that? It was, I need to copy this one, I need to remember that one. It was git checkout minus b, and how should we call it? We should we call it past project. And I don't want to create a branch where I am right now, I want to create it pointing to the past as if it was created back then. So that's the one. And if I now have a look in the project, it will look exactly as it looked back then when, when the person in 2017 made that modification. And finally, how would I bring it to the code one step before? And why is that useful? It's useful if you do some history inspection and you realize that, aha, I introduced a problem here. How, how, get, how do I get the project right before I introduce the problem? You can do it. One way is, well, I do git log one line. And this is where I am right now. And I create another branch from this hash. But if I don't remember to do that, I can. You can also refer to parents of commits with like this. So git checkout minus b. Let's call it just before. And I can refer to commits by. I want the first parent of this commit, and it will have the same effect as if I have written five one six one. And now, now I have a branch just before the thing happened. Yeah, just catching up here with the good suggestions on the document. Thanks for that. Suggestion 66, also really looking forward to how can we word it better? Let's, let's improve it. Let's improve it together. So please let me know how we can word the exercise better than so that the next exercise group has a bit easier life. Yes, Daniel? Yeah, I was uh, thinking whether it would be nice to mention bisect also. Oh yeah, so we will, this is one of these things where it's good that you know that this exists, but you don't have to know how it works because it's nicely described here. But I want you to know when, that you will probably come into the situation where something used to work, suddenly it doesn't work anymore. Things have changed, but fortunately we have been committing every day. So fortunately, we can go back. We just don't know how far way back we should go. And there is, a, there is a boring way to find out when something changed. And that is by, we can go one step back, one step back, you know, parent of this commit, parent of that commit, and commit by commit by commit, we can find when was it that something changed. But there is a nicer way. And there is a tool called Git Bisect, which can help you locating a particular commit which changed a behavior. And there is a fun exercise. We will not do the exercise now. If you're interested in this, try it out one of the afternoons. Um, and in this exercise repository, we have created a problem for you. And we have created 500 commits. And your task will be to find when during these 500 commits something changed. And this can even be automated. So please remember that this nice Swiss army knife git bisect exists. One day it will save you a few days of work. And then you can come back here and find out how this works in detail. Hopefully this tool set was useful, will be useful. Um, I return to this 
every couple of weeks. But I think now we can I can hand over the screen and the microphone to Dania to to show us how we can undo mistakes that will will happen. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Trying to share. So we am I sharing? No. So we we continue with undoing and recovering. Um, this is uh, some of my favorite lessons of Git. I do a lot of mistake uh, unknowingly or unknowingly. So some of these commands I use daily. Mm. And this is what I define it as like or version control as un unlimited undoing that you can do it on Git. So in this session, uh, we try to discuss these commands here. It's not uh, necessary for you to type along uh, since it might be too overwhelming with all these commands. But if you're interested to type along, that's also good. Uh, but it's not uh, necessary. And we will have, I hope we will have some time for exercise. Yes, 15 minutes. So let's start. Um, so how to undo changes safely on Git. Uh, we could uh, think about some scenarios um, where you modify something. Am I sharing properly? It looks good on my side, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So may I ask you, uh, most time, um, mostly how uh, how do you end up with it? Uh, when you, or what is the scenario use cases for you to undo on Git? Like, so uh, I mean, Git? like what are my typical mistakes? Yes. So very, I think my most typical mistake, what I what happens, actually happened yesterday, uh, is committing to the wrong branch. We have motivated it. branches are wonderful and let's create many of them, but sometimes I create a commit and I realize oof, it's in the wrong place. But maybe we will get to that in a moment. What I yeah. um, maybe maybe a little bit easier is that that I make some modification. And then I realized that, well, the modification doesn't make it better. I want to go back to the last committed state. Yeah. So here I'm going back to my uh, uh, recipe uh, repository. So I just uh, see the it graph. And um, yeah, you see, I am on my main uh, branch, but there are two branches, which uh, one of them, which are merged. So I am trying to. Um, update uh, the ingredients uh, and I'm adding some like probably sugar. Uh, um, and I realized that uh, later sugar is not needed for the recipe. That's, uh, 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 that's I don't want to add sugar to my recipe. So you, if you see it status, I, I have modified ingredients. And if I go to uh, view the contents of the file, I added sugar. But can we also uh, try, or can we try get diff as well? Yeah. yeah so you could, I you could see that I added sugar, but I haven't staged or committed yet. Uh, and uh, this is a very crazy thing to add sugar to this recipe. So I I could edit this uh, um, file, but Git has this uh, another feature uh, so that you can uh, go back to your, um, you don't need to manually edit it. Git, you do it for that. That's the command for that is, uh, you can do it a uh, different way, git restore and uh, restore selectively for files. So you can use git restore p. So I will 
try to you do git restore uh, with the dot that dot means uh, all all folders below it's uh, it's the same as uh, unix commands dot means am i right rather yes oh. it means everything here and below mm -hmm. Yeah, so you see that I have added uh, sugar, but I haven't staged or committed. So I'm just, uh, I'm not doing it manually. I'm not editing manually the file, but I use the git restore command. And then if I try to don't use um, arrows. So if you want, if I check my file, you could see that uh, the sugar is uh, deleted by git restore command. So if I go for git defecting, there is not any difference. So git do it for you, but rather than do you do it manually. If you are uh, not staged, your commit uh, commit. So that's one thing. And the next. Um, so maybe before moving on, um, yeah. uh, we can. There was a question whether this same thing works with git checkout, and yes. So git restore file and git checkout file will do the same thing. Git restore is the more modern way of expressing it, but both will have the same effect. Yeah. The checkout has a different meaning in different contexts. So that's why we use a restore here, but checkout should work. Thanks for pointing out. So yeah, it's. It's already mentioned in the note. So now if I'm staging something and then I, I think that after st staging before committing, I think uh, I don't want to stay uh, commit this and I want to go back to the previous um, previous commit. So that also we can use this uh, git restore and dash dash stage command and followed by git status and git restore and rather, there is another option you can use git reset uh, hard head that will throw away everything after you after your last commit and after you uh, this the ones you staged um, and you will go back to um, the last commit so shall we try that shall i try uh, to yes let's try it out yeah mm -hmm. So this command git reset hard is good to know about. It's also really dangerous because, but it's also useful. Like anything, it can remove. It can also remove commits. Yeah. So I'm trying to add some pepper, and I, uh, I could see that I have added a pepper, and I'm just trying to. Um, stage that changes then i found that okay i don't want to have a paper or, or you, at some point of time you want to go back to that so um would what what command you do suggest to we uh, show the example restore or reset i think, I would, I think we should demonstrate uh, so we mean which of the two yeah I have this um, tendency to do this reset and then, uh, but it's a, it's a tricky command, so you have to be very careful. So I could uh, uh, go uh, try git, uh, git restore, probably. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit safer. So the git reset yeah. hard will do the job, but if I mistype instead of head, I type something else in there. It will re remove everything after that happened after. And so then I know the status. If I check, uh, it's gone back to modified. It's not staged now. So we could uh, go back to the previous command, is uh, restore uh, dot. Then if if I try the it if between. Uh, then there is no changes. So I'm I'm back to um, the last commit. That's what we saw in a uh, git graph earlier. Or I could uh, say git uh, 
log uh, one line. So it will always show uh, my history in one line. So that's, I like more than graph. Um, but uh, this is uh, this is the two commands uh, or many options you can use when you are uh, modifying something before staging and after staging also you can go back to the previous uh, commit. Um, there is another thing you can revert back to commit. Uh, what do you mean so to revert back? It means like, okay, Rado, how, what do you mean revert back? If I want to go back to the previous commit, does that mean to revert back? So now in reverting commits uh, in Git means actually creating a new commit that does an opposite of some previous commit. So it's a it's a really safe way of because it doesn't modify the, the history, it's a safe way of undoing changes. So if there is a commit that happened already and it's been committed and I want to undo it, a safe way to do that is with git revert. Mm -hmm. which will create a commit that applies the opposite of my reverted commit. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but then there will be a new commit with a revert. Mm -hmm. So it, it preserves the history. Let's try yeah. that. If I want to go back to my uh, merge branch less salt, that's a, uh, that's a hash uh, for that. I want to go back to uh, that. Oh, or, but oh no, don't, sorry. Yeah. So I think if you want to demonstrate it, then maybe it would be easier if we create a new commit. Mm -hmm. Let's let's create a new commit with some unusual ingredient, and let's commit it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what is what is unusual or oh, licorice or uh, oh, is there something that doesn't belong into. Yeah, maybe Apple. Yeah. Mm, so, yeah. So let's do that and let's commit it also. Oh, I'm so sorry. So the is for. Yeah. Uh, let's commit that one. So get add, get commit. Oh, so get, get add. And get commit. And now first, let's have a look at it. either git graph or git log. But we got this new commit there at the end. Yeah. And now we have this realization, we don't like apples anymore in uh, guacamole, so let's revert it. And the way to do it is then git revert and then refer to the identifier d8ab3, that one. And it will create a new commit. Well, let's try it out. So that and enter. Yeah. And it suggests this. So the, com the suggested commit message is revert the previous commit message. And also it has this information. We could modify it, but I typically leave it unless there yeah. is unless there is a reason for me to write why do I revert it. So we could also write down like why, but. Yeah, let's have uh, it mm -hmm. as it is. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's, yeah. let's have a look at the graph again. So nothing happened to the to the D8AB commit, it's still there, but we got a new commit. And something that might be also fun to do is to do git show D8AB and then git show E8FD. And we will see that they do opposite things, yeah. This one removes the apple, the other one adds it. So that's yeah. that's get revert. Yeah, maybe we could show. Uh, just want to emphasize that uh, it's not necessary to type hello, but we are just uh, trying to sh show it to you that you can try you during the exercise. Mm -hmm. Are we on time? I think we are pretty good. Should we soon send people to the exercise, but before that, tell them what they should do in there? Or yeah, we have three. Uh, yeah, we we have uh, 
three exercises, at least we expect them to have time to do two. So there is one exercise to revert a commit. So uh, you could try it in exercise room, but we are not going to exercise room now. We just try some more commands and uh, then we will go to exercise room and then we can come back and uh, summarize everything. Uh, is there anything in, uh, on HackMD? Some questions we should take? It's I'm watching, but or... I think nothing that needs to be I think yeah. nothing that needs to be now re-answered. Re okay, I'm, I'm sorry that if it feels a little bit rushing, uh, but uh, the main thing is that you can always come back to the course material. So. Yeah, so I think we have, we should start in sort of three minutes, we should start with the exercise. Yeah. So like uh, there is other thing, it's Git and uh, so if you have done something and you want to uh, realize that you forgot something, you could use a Git amend. Can you send, uh, say some the use case of that Git amend for you, Adam? For me, it's when I forgot, forgot to, to add something to a commit. So I made a commit, but then I realized, oh, there's this other file, which I forgot to add and commit. But it also belongs to this one. Then I mm -hmm. use the Git commit amend. So okay. to 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 make an amendment to to the to the last commit, which I haven't shared with anybody yet. So I don't I don't like to modify commits that I have shared with other people because that changes the history. But if it's only on my computer, and there is this one mm -hmm. file that I forgot, then it's get get commit amend. Yeah, uh, you can amend uh, with any um, amend any commit hash, right? Not only the last one. With specified commit? Uh, I think to the last one. I think okay. it will be, I don't know exactly what will happen if you amend to a past, because then you create basically a new branching point in somewhere in the past. Mm -hmm. Shall we try git commit amend here? What did it uh, do? What we could also do is that I have a feeling we could also send people to the exercise and they could explore some of these on their own. Yeah. So that we have also then time to, to really discuss later how much git after all of this. Where should people really start? Yes. How much kit is necessary? Yes. And uh, we expect uh, them at least try out these two exercises. Uh, it's uh, creating a branch, uh, create a commit, and uh, uh, do git revert as the last uh, trying this uh, git amend command. You have the solutions here. So you, you, if you have some out, you could uh, uh, check the solution for the exercise too. I'm not sure you will have the time to exercise three, uh, but if okay. yeah, okay, yeah. if you have time, you can go through this exercise three, and when we come back, we will go for a break and then summarize these things. Am I right? Or I have some difficulties to uh, oh, hear you. Because, because I had I was muted. So okay. let uh, sorry for that. So mm -hmm. what I want to say is we will send you to an exercise and we will be back uh, by the full hour. Then we will greet you here on stream, but to send you into a 10 minute break. And after that, we will use the last 20 minutes to summarize to summarize Git and to get you on a good path, like where to start after all of this. Um, and I would say here, that mm -hmm. it's a motivate you to use Git. Uh, that's the best uh, for me as a learner from a learner perspective. Uh, motivate you is uh, uh, using Git is the best part. So I wouldn't miss it any anything. Yeah. So the last twenty minutes not to be missed. And so please experiment with undoing. Yeah. Start with the one that you find most interesting. The the, the green box most interesting in this episode. Yeah. Welcome back. Uh, and now I will summarize what we were doing uh, for this uh, undoing and recovering session. And I have, I would like to say about something about git reset command. Git reset uh, dash dash hard, we can use to go back to uh, the specific commit. And then uh, all 
all the history will be modified according to that. This command you can use uh, multiple times for, for example, recovering from committing the wrong branch so that um, use another command uh, like git cherry pick as well for that relevant or which one you see when you commit to the wrong branch. Uh, can you scroll down a bit? I think yeah. I use the solution to my personally. Yeah, me but too. Both are, both are fine. So, but what, what I do here is that if I realize that I commit to the wrong branch, mm -hmm. so there are a couple of commits. First, first I create the branch that I wanted to create before I do anything. And then I move the, the other branch back. I rewind it back with git reset heart. So I use and solution two. One more thing about the hash. It should, uh, it's recommended to be careful using hash and check that when with the git log history. And is a git uh, uh, allows you to go, if you do the mistake with git reset hard, is git allow you to come or go back or find your way back? Yes, you can even, you can even recover from that. And I wonder whether we mentioned it somewhere on the page, but not here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you can do it uh, um, um, after you become a bit more experienced with Git. You can play around with all these commands. Uh, so I suggest you to go through this course material, and uh, now we can uh, go back to the discussion how much Git is necessary. That when are you going to take over this game? Yes, working on it. Yeah, and thank you for your feedback and uh, questions here. And you can ask questions later today or tomorrow as well, again, related to this session. Yeah. So the, in the remaining 15 minutes, um, a couple of things we can do. Please give us again feedback and the document. Maybe somebody can paste the questions, one thing that you like, one thing that we should improve. Um, in the remaining 15 minutes, we would like to go to this part here, how much Git is necessary? Because we mentioned a few things. Oh, so where should we start? What is a good balance? And here you can, the more question you ask, the better. Uh, please keep a lot of questions coming. It doesn't have to be only about recovering, it can be about anything Git. And let's talk about these. So how much Git is really necessary? Let me zoom in here. We have written a few points. There is a lot of complexity. There are branches. What level of complexity is necessary for each project? Of course, it depends. And I think we should have a bingo card from every time somebody says it depends. So for simple personal projects, if it's just me and I'm starting out, it's a small project, I often start and I only have the main branch or the master branch. And sometimes I only use that one branch and I put everything in there. And then maybe later, if you, if you want to then put unfinished, untested ideas a little bit aside, then you can start using branches. So then I use branches for unfinished, untested ideas. Uh, every time I'm not sure about the change, but I don't want to lose it. So I put it on a side branch. You can then use tags to, to mark important milestones like release every time you share your code then with the community or it could be the published version. It could be the version that is used in the PhD thesis. OK. Um, then over time, projects that started out as a one-person project then get more people join in. And even then, it might still be OK. You can still agree that, well, until things break, let's use the master branch or the main branch. Oh, it might still be reasonable to come into the main branch. You can start using feature branches. 
and you accept that from time to time things will break, but then we will fix them. For larger projects, um, this doesn't maybe doesn't work anymore. Maybe you will get tired of that the main branch is sometimes not building, not compiling, not working. What some projects do is uh, they they make their main branch write, write protected so nobody can change it. And we didn't really show you how to do it and we will show that tomorrow. So they, uh, but it's already good to think about it that you can then write protect the main branch. Nobody can push changes to it. Every time you want to make any modifications, you always create a new branch and you, you do your work. And once you're happy, you, you send a change proposal and tomorrow we will see that in the GitHub, this is called a pull request. And changes are always reviewed by somebody else. And this is two effects, at least two effects. One effect is that hopefully it improves quality, but it also improves learning because then at least one more person knows about this change. So it, it improves knowledge transfer in the project. So changes are reviewed by somebody else. We will also then learn how can we couple it with automated testing. More about that tomorrow and next week. And only after review, after code review, things are merged into, into the main branch, which means that the main branch then moves a little bit slower, but more than one person knows about it. Yes. Comment 92, to be honest, I'm quite often using only main branch in my personal projects, and so do I, and so do many. It's really only when there are two, three more people, and once it's starting to get big and used by many people, then, then we need more. One moment when you often need more than one branch is when you distribute releases, when you distribute your project as a package, then you maybe need more, more than that. And there are different branching models and different strategies on how to do that. A few more questions here. One is, we have mentioned staging, but how often uh, should we stage? Should we commit? Or how about this staging area? Why did we do this git add and then git commit? In fact, instead of doing git add some file and then git commit, you can directly do git commit some file if this file is already tracked by git. So it is okay to commit directly. It's good to commit early and often. So it's better to create too many commits rather than too few because you can always combine commits later. And once you commit, it is very hard to lose this change. So it's a nice way to back, back up your work. If you try to do uh, any dangerous things like this git reset hard, any undoing operations, and git, uh, what was it? Git restore and git checkout. It's always safer to rather commit it, put it somewhere, create a branch, commit, commit to work. If you later change your mind, you can always come back so that you have like a safeguard if anything goes badly with the undoing. But what you might notice later that after, after using Git for a while, I think you might learn to appreciate the staging area because then I can have lots of modifications in my, fold, in my working directory, but then I can selectively prepare them for the next commit. And even you will see that sometimes you have unrelated changes in the same file, and then you can selectively stage and selectively commit only portions of a file so that they end up in nicely, nicely packaged commits. And what is a nicely packaged commit? So how, how large should a commit be? What is a good size? Depends once again, but better too small than too large. So in doubt, many commits. Often I make a commit 
at the end of the day or before going to lunch, or something that I don't want to lose. So it's a unit that I would not like to lose. Sometimes I work on a commit for multiple days, but then I always save my work with staging. Smaller sized commits are easy to review. So once you then implement code review in your group and other people look over your commits, they will rather like to look over a commit that has 10 modifications, 10 lines, rather than 20,000 lines. Imperfect commits are better than no commits. We talked about commit messages and staging area, and but let, let the perfect not be the enemy of the good enough. What we want here is good enough commits. Um, we try to, a commit should not contain unrelated changes to simplify review. And also later, if you decide to repair a commit, undo it, adjust. It's easier to repair it and it's easier to undo it if it doesn't couple unrelated things together. But yet again, imperfect is better than no. And now we have seven minutes left. Looking at the document, I wish there were more questions and more comments. So the takeaway from these two days, uh, what do you uh, say about that? Is it uh, uh, so that the learners know about Git and the functionality of Git and they try their own and be the expert in that? So takeaway from, from these two days is not to be afraid to go into your project, type it in it, start tracking it with Git. Don't be afraid to put it out on GitHub. It, it doesn't have to be perfect. It never will be perfect. It will never be finished. It's better to share something work in progress. Um, commit often, later experiment with branches and staging. Uh, we have used the command line, but it is perfectly fine to use uh, graphical user interfaces. You can do many of the things that we've shown. We can, you can do through your browser. You can do it in tools like GitHub Desktop. You can use many editors. Can can do Git actions directly out of the editor. Many integrated development environments have Git built, Git built in. So all of these things you can do there with mouse clicks. But now we also understand what these things mean. You want to say something about SSH keys for tomorrow? Yeah, it's very important to set it up. And so we have these install instructions, we have videos, but I know that even traversing those, there can still be trouble if you have a computer that is managed by a university and where you don't have administrator access. So we have heard about some troubles from there. But this is something that we will need for collaboration. What about licensing before making code public? That's a very important question, and we have a session on that next week. If this is code written by others, where, where you are not the owner of the code or where licensing is not very clear, then we have to be careful before making it public. What else can we say? What should we clarify? Now I'm going through this uh, comedy. Thanks also for the feedback. Yeah, thank you. It's useful for us. Yes, so there is no there is no one size fits all. Start simple, grow your projects. We learn as we go. Don't try to make it too perfect. Well, 
we will tomorrow learn how to collaborate together because so far we have been only on in our isolated repositories on our laptops. But tomorrow we will use the internet to communicate commits and synchronize, collaborate. We will talk about code review, pull requests. What is also nice is that all of our lessons are open and on GitHub. And then tomorrow you will learn how to modify even those. So then you, if you see things that can be improved and things that are wrong, and if there is a better way, then you can also send us changes and suggestions. I see around 130 people online on HackMD, according to the thing. And that's a lot less, a lot more than the number of people that have answered the poll. So please answer at least this top part here. This is really useful for us. Let's see, are there any other questions down below? No. Should I commit secrets? So, comments on that. No secrets. Uh, if it's a password, yeah. then no, because it will be in the Git history even if you remove it. Of course, it's possible to then modify the history. Yeah. I guess I'd say is the repository secret. If you commit a secret, then the repository is secret forever, unless you modify history. So what I would often do is I have one repository for all the public information, and then another repository that has only the secrets. So the public one is on GitHub and shared and all that. And I say in the documentation, okay, so in order to run this, you need this other secret repository, which of course other people don't have, but at least it is, mm, at least people can learn from the public part. Are there any other things you would like to learn about Git that you, that we haven't? covered. Not that we have much more time or anything, but um, you know, maybe we can comment. So in the future, if you're using Git and you have trouble, what would you do? Like, where would you get help? So at least if you're at my university, Alto University, we have a support as part of my team. So I would recommend to most people that if you get stuck with Git, ask someone. So it's better to work together. And by working with someone, um, you can learn faster. This is really true for almost everything, but especially Git. It's a very good point. Everything I know, I know from other people. Well, I think we are out of time. Yeah, okay. So we will continue collecting this feedback here and continue looking at the questions. You will find the videos on Twitch immediately you will find them on YouTube later today. The feedback and the Q&A will stay here until it's moved to the website. And you will get an email and the website will say preparation for tomorrow. So, yes, see you then. Thanks see for joining and Thanks remember, tell your friends to join tomorrow. So starting tomorrow with sharing and GitHub is even useful for people that know the stuff today. So join with friends. Okay, bye.